what I want to talk about now, I want to talk about uh, rulership over the earth and really rulership over man as well. And so this teaching is going to talk about a transition of authority and how that changed over time and where are we and where are our unbelieving friends. And so then, so we'll see, you know, we'll see as we go through this that Satan actually became the god of this world. And when we get a clear picture about what's actually happening and who's actually in charge over the earth, then that will help us in our rightly dividing exercise that we talked about in the last teaching. Because it gives me a different default position in my rightly dividing than what I had before I understood the concept of authority. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through these five kind of phases of transition of rulership over the earth. And so we're going to go through each of these, you know, in detail with scriptures. So first of all, you know, in the beginning, man was the ruler, or you could say man was the God of this world because God created the earth for us to have dominion over. And so it was our place to rule and reign. So God wanted us to be like him and have a domain to rule over and he made the earth specifically for that purpose so that we could have our own domain to rule over. So we were the rulers, we were the gods of this world on you know, page one of the Bible. Then number two, Satan took over the role of ruler of this world or God of this world when man submitted under the devil's authority by way of sinning. And so that unfortunate deed of sinning um, turned everything upside down you know so man came underneath the devil as a result of that sin and then he gained that position of rulership and lordship and godship over man and that's when all the bad things started happening for us unfortunately that also was very much in the beginning as we know okay then number three uh, when jesus came to this earth he delegated authority to his disciples and he demonstrated you know how to destroy the works of the devil and how to make the devil submit to his will and so we'll take a look at that and so that was delegated authority so man was starting to um, a few men you know just the disciples were starting to you know have a taste of what life is going to be like you know after the cross okay then number four jesus died for us and his blood washes away the sins of all believers in him thus ransoming us out from under the devil's authority and restoring us as rulers and gods of this world. Um, you know, then our commission resumes where we're to destroy the works of the devil, we're to continue the works of Jesus. And so in the teaching after this one, um, I'll talk about how to actually put that authority into practice, how to get uh, ideally all of your prayers answered. So we'll talk about that because that's where we need to be. We need to be continuously destroying all the work that the devil's doing because God has you know, given believers, he's given us the authority of Christ. Amen. Okay, then the fifth thing we'll talk about will be uh, unborn again man still continues to lie under the rulership of the devil until he has his sins washed away by accepting Jesus by way of salvation. Um, and so, unfortunately for unborn again man, the devil is still like ruling and reigning and lording over him and bad things are continuously happening to unborn again men. But eventually, um, we know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord and this will be remedied, you know, in due time, right? So, this is what we're going to go through. So, the first thing, you know, God created the earth for man to rule over. So God created man in his image, part of which is rulership. God rules over the heavens and he wanted man to have a place to rule over. So he created the earth, he created man, and he gave man dominion and authority and rulership over the earth and everything in it. And you could say that in the beginning, you know, so page one of the Bible, Genesis chapter one, um, Adam and Eve, you know, we were the gods of this world. You know, that's the way... Um, God designed things. You know, He intended for us to rule and reign over the earth and everything in it. So we can see that in Genesis and in the Psalms. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so it's obvious here, you know, God made the earth first and then he created man and his intention was that we would reign supreme over everything in the earth, you know, over the, all the animals, you know, all the creeping things, over all the earth, you know, the earth itself, the weather and so forth. Um, we also know that he instructed us, you know, he said, fill the earth and subdue it. That's a command. So our command was to subdue the earth. And you know, by by using that term sub, subdue, and it's the Hebrew word kabosh, um, that indicates that something was out of order or something was wild and needed to be tamed. And so it was our responsibility to subdue the earth. So anything out of alignment with the will of God, we should have subdued it as opposed to, you know, aligning with it, right? And we know that the devil was in the earth because he actually tempted you know Adam and Eve. And that led to our downfall. You know, so evil was in the earth and, and our responsibility was not to agree with it or align with it or perform it, but to subdue it. Okay. And unfortunately that didn't happen. And we'll talk about that on an upcoming page, but we had dominion over the earth and everything in it. And importantly, you know, the devil was in the earth. And so we had, we, in the beginning on page one of your Bible, we even had dominion over the devil because everything in the earth we had um, we had rulership over okay we can see in psalm um, 8 verses 6 to 8 you have made him you know mankind to have dominion over the work of your hands you have put all things under his feet all the sheep and oxen even the beasts of the field the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea Okay, so you can see that this one is speaking about um, we have dominion over all the physical things in the earth, all the, all the created beings in the earth. And Psalm 115 to 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Okay, so this is important because, you know, when God gives something, it's like a, it's a legal transaction. So he, he gave the earth to man. It was our place to rule and reign over. It wasn't his intention to rule and reign over the earth. It was his intention that we rule and reign over the earth. It was his intention that we don't bow down to evil, but that we subdue everything in the earth, right? And so that was his intention from the beginning. And, you know, the original chain of authority, you know, we have God above, you know, God was over man, man was over earth. And you could even say that man was over the devil because the devil was in the earth and should have been subdued, right? And then, um, and, and then subsequent events happen and unfortunately we bow down to the devil and we'll look at scriptures um, pertaining to that. Okay, so we were literally on page one of your Bible. We were the rulers of this world. We were the gods of this world. We had dominion over the earth and everything in it. Okay, then let's take a look at the devil. And so what we need to learn about him is, you know, his above all mindset, you know, is that he wants to be worshipped. You know, a lot of times people will ask questions, you know, well, if the devil was the God of this world, how come he didn't just kill everybody? Well, he doesn't really want to kill everybody. What he really wants is he wants to be worshipped. And, and so that's his dr primary driving force. And if you, if you come into opposition with him being God and being worshiped, then you really become his enemy, right? But he would rather you just be, you know, his subordinate that loves him and worships him. And that is his above all desire is to be worshiped as God. Okay. There is nothing the devil wants more than this. In fact, he fell from heaven because of his desire to be like the most high. In other words, he wanted to be God and he wanted to be worshipped as God. And the devil, he employs various tactics to draw worship. You know, he may give promises of authority, promises of glory. Um, he may use lies and deception. 
He may use miraculous signs that we would think only God could, could perform. So we're deceived and we think that he is God just by way of the miraculous signs that he's performing. So he's got, um, at a minimum, these are some of the tactics that he uses to try and draw worship. And now let's just take a look at this. So we know uh, from Isaiah chapter 14, um, when it says Lucifer, we're talking about Satan, right? So how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Okay, so he's, he's wanting to be God. He wants to be worshipped. He wanted to exalt himself above the stars of God. And he says, I will be like the Most High. So he's, he's basically, he's declaring himself to be a God. You know, that is his mission in life. He wants to be God. Okay, and, and so then we come to Matthew chapter 4. Where, and we're going to see, like in these next scriptures, we're going to see how his desire to be worshipped is playing out. So in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, this is where we have the temptation of Jesus. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. I mean, can you just believe the audacity of the devil? So here he is, he, you know, he's with Jesus and he's taking him up on a high mountain and then he's just showing him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory and he's like jesus all these things i will give you if you will fall down and worship me I mean, so I, it's just like phenomenal that the devil himself is trying to tempt the son of god into worshiping him and so we have to remember that all the things that Jesus was tempted with are real temptations that the devil also gives to men. Because remember, Jesus had to overcome the same temptations that tempted man and caused our, our downfall. Um, Jesus had to successfully deal with all those temptations. So during that time in the wilderness for those 40 days, he was enduring all kinds of different temptations. And we have a few examples written in the Gospels, but surely he experienced many other things. But one of the temptations of the devil is, you know, he wants to be worshipped and he will entice you with maybe like fame or glory, um, maybe power and authority, riches. You know, so those are some of the things that he uses to entice us to get us to bow down to him. And, and to me, that personally has been coming, has been becoming more and more evident. Like when you look at, you know, I look at things like Hollywood and the music industry with new eyes over the last three or four years. And so now I see that Many of the people that have ascended into these uh, positions of stardom, um, you can see obvious like indications of satanic worship. You know, you see some of them have like a, a Baphomet, um, you know, Baphomet thing on their necklace. You'll have all these demonic rituals they put on, and and so I was like, when I was a kid or when I was a teenager, listening to like heavy metal music and had all these satanic album covers, I never really thought anything about it. I thought it was just for showmanship. But now understanding this, it's not about showmanship. These people have sold their soul to the devil because he promised them the same thing he's promising Jesus. All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And I used to have the mindset, how can anybody worship the devil? But I guess the allure of fame and power and things like that uh, has caused many to succumb to it, right? And so this is a real thing, you know, and what the devil wants is he wants to be worshipped and he's going to try and bait people in with something that's appealing to them. Even Jesus himself, he was trying to get to worship him. He didn't want to kill Jesus in the beginning. He wanted, he wanted the worship. Okay, if we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. You know, so people don't necessarily know, probably a lot of people that worship the devil don't know that they're worshiping the devil. They're worshiping um, someone who they think is God because the devil doesn't present himself as a devil. 
you know, the devil presents himself as being righteous. He presents himself as God himself. He presents himself as an angel of light. His, his ministers present themselves as ministers of the gospel. And so many people think that they're actually bowed down to God, but in fact, they've been deceived and they're off on some different gospel with a, a devil who doesn't necessarily look um, straight up evil, right? So he's very deceptive in that way. You know, if he can draw you away from Jesus with something that, that looks holy, then he'll do that. I mean, look at all the other religions of the world, you know. So all these other religions of the world, people, they literally think they're worshiping God. Um, but they've been deceived. They're worshiping some angel, some something that might look like an angel of light, something that might look like God. But truly, they have been deceived and they've been led, led away from Jesus, which is another one of his objectives. So all the wrong religions of the world, the devil is receiving worship under various different names, you know. Under the names of the Hindu gods, he's receiving worship. Under the names pertaining to you know, Islam, he's receiving worship. Or any religion that you could name besides Christianity, the devil is literally, he is receiving that worship under different names. Okay? So he wants to be worshipped above all things. Alright, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, so again, people don't think, most people, some people worship an evil image of the devil because you know, that's appealing to them for some reason. But most people that are worshiping the devil don't realize they're worshiping the devil. They think that they're worshiping God. But there's, if you look closely at the nature of the God they're worshiping, there's going to be things that are wrong with them, right? And so you have to be perceptive um, to, to see what's going on. But the devil himself and his agents, like the son of perdition, they will present themselves as though they are God. They're going to sit in the temple of God. They are um, they're going to exalt themselves above everything that's called God, everything that is worshipped, um, and and you know the whole purpose again is the devil wants to be worshipped, and he will find any way possible to make it happen. You know he will present himself in a multitude of different religions. Um, he will. You know, for some, he'll be the devil directly, and people will worship someone that they knowingly know is evil. Um, but one way or the other, he wants to draw worship. Okay, if we come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Okay, so this is actually a continuation of the same passage, but the way that he's going to deceive them, or, or you know, a few of the ways, is he's going um, he's going to utilize miraculous power. So this word power, it's the word dunamis, and dunamis, we know that's also, you know, the Holy Spirit has dunamis power. It's that miraculous supernatural power. Well, you know, the devil and his kingdom, they are angels. And angels have, you know, they have power. They don't have the, the full power of God, obviously, but they do have miraculous power. And I'm sure different angels have different powers. You know, we don't really know how all that works, but the devil and his agents, they have um, some degree of miraculous power. They have the ability to produce miraculous signs. They have the ability to produce lying wonders. And they have the ability to produce all manner of deceptions. And so there's many people, and you can see this in the Old Testament too, there's many people that will worship the beast because they think it's God. Because how, you know, you know this, this person, you know, this being that I'm worshiping caused fire to come down from heaven, it must be God. You know, who else could do that? And so because of that fallacy in man's thinking, Man thinks that the only one who can do miraculous deeds is God himself. But the, the, the reality is that 
some angels, if not all of them, but some angels at a minimum can perform miraculous signs and wonders to a degree, and that becomes a huge deception for man. You can see it in the Old Testament. You can see in the book of Revelation where there's various signs that the beast will perform to draw worship. And so it's, it's not that man necessarily is willing, willfully worshiping an evil image of God, but they've been deceived, right? And so this is just a, a tactic. Lying, lying wonders, actual power, actual miraculous signs, and then every form of deception. Okay, Revelations chapter 13 gives a few specifics. He performs, and it's talking about the, the beast, um, the second beast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to, to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Okay, so here you can see, you know, what is the purpose of this beast? The purpose of this beast is to perform miraculous signs and wonders. For what reason? To draw worship. Okay, so he's performing great signs. He's doing it in the sight of men for men to observe so that we will be deceived. And his goal is to deceive us, to think that he's God, by the signs that he's performing, um, such as, you know, fire coming down from heaven. Okay, and just kind of relate back to the last teaching, you know, this is talking about the second beast. This is an upcoming beast. Um, this is the second beast, and he's performing signs that the first beast already performed, fire from heaven. And we talked about this in the last teaching back in the Old Testament. There are many instances of fire coming down from heaven, and that fire from heaven beast was being worshipped as the Lord your God uh, in many instances. And so people were deceived, worshipping whom they thought was God, but was actually the fire from heaven beast. And this second beast is going to perform the same signs as that first beast that already came back in the Old Testament. And the, again, his purpose is to deceive you with great signs, such as fire from heaven, so that you will, um, so that you will worship. So you will draw worship to the beast, draw worship to the devil. That is his mission. Okay. So, so what we see on this page then is that the devil's primary objective is to be worshipped. He wants to be God. And then he's got all these different tactics that we just looked at on how he's going to accomplish and draw forth that worship. Okay, so then um, let's talk about how Satan actually did become the God and the ruler of this world. So when God created earth and placed man in it as the rulers and gods of this world, Satan saw the perfect opportunity to become God. He tricked Adam and Eve into sinning. This sin was a legal transaction whereby the devil gained legal authority over mankind because we submitted to him via sin. We legally submitted ourselves underneath the devil's authority so that he became the God of this world with legal authority over mankind and legal authority over the earth which man possessed. Okay, and so, and let's just start off. Um, so, he, the devil, he, he used deception. The deception produced sin. And then when we sinned, then there was a transition of rulership and authority over man and earth. So, in Genesis chapter 3, um, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, so 
I don't want to debate whether this is literal or whether it's a parable. The point is that when sin occurred, the devil deceived man, and then man sinned, and then what happened? Okay, then what happened is Romans 6.16 happened. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Okay, so when Adam and Eve sinned, they literally, they submitted themselves under the devil's authority. They became slaves to obey the devil, who is the father of sin and who has the power of death. Okay, it's a legal transaction. We legally submitted ourselves under the authority of the devil by aligning with his will as opposed to God's will. And when that sin occurred, you know, basically the cord was cut with God um, and we have to have that sin washed away to be reconnected. And because there's sin inside of us, the devil has legal authority over us. When the sin gets washed away, the devil loses his authority over us. So that's why Jesus had to come and do the things that he did, you know, to wash away our sins. And we'll talk about that at length later on. Okay, so, um, you know, what, what evidence do we have that the devil actually gained authority because of this event? Okay, so there's many things we could look at, but we'll look at three passages. In Colossians 1, 13 to 14, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so this um, passage right here, uh, it's talking about Father Father God has delivered us, you know, believers, from the power of darkness. And this word power, it's the word, the Greek word exousia, which literally means authority. So Father God, by way of Jesus, has delivered us from the authority of darkness. And so he, he translates us, he conveys us out of the authority of darkness, you know, the devil's authority, and he translates us into the kingdom of the sun, or you could say the kingdom of God. Okay, so he rescues us out from under the devil's authority and brings us into the authority of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that means that, um, th that before our Savior came, all mankind, and until your sins are washed away, all mankind resides under the authority of darkness. Until you accept Jesus, until you have your sins washed away, until you have forgiveness of sins, you are under the devil's authority. And all of that happened because of what happened in the beginning with um, Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. When that happened, the, we came under the devil's authority. He had legal authority over anyone that has sinned. So the only one... that. He, the only human that the devil never had authority over was Jesus, because Jesus had no sin. Okay? So that's why it, that's why sin's a big deal, because if somebody is still in their sins, if somebody has not accepted Jesus, they are literally in the devil's kingdom still. He is their legal ruler because he has, he, he has something in them. He has sin in them, therefore he owns them, therefore they are his slaves. Okay, we can come to Acts chapter 26. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Okay, so again, this word power, it's the word exousia, so it's authority. You know, so sometimes the Bible translators, you know, they pick the word power. Sometimes they pick the word authority. But literally, this is authority. This is not dunamis, miraculous power. This is authority power, the authority of rulership, the authority of, of dominion. Like um, a king has power. A king has authority to rule a domain. Okay, so we were under the rule of the devil. So it's interesting if you pay attention here. He says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people and the Gentiles. To whom I now send you to open their eyes, the Jewish people and the Gentiles, to open their eyes and to turn them, Jewish people and the Gentiles, from the authority of the devil to God. So, isn't it interesting? You know, if, if somebody is in Judaism today, 
they, they are not born again. They are not in the kingdom of God. They are not believing in Jesus. They are under the influence of an antichrist spirit. You know, so, so often we're trying to connect ourselves with Israel and we think that it's the same, you know, it's almost the same religion. It's not. If you're in Judaism, you have rejected Jesus. You're under an antichrist spirit that is keeping you separated from Jesus. If you're in Judaism, you are believing in the law. And the, when, you're, um, when you're under the law, Christ will profit you nothing. You have fallen from grace. You are estranged from Christ. You are estranged from God. So when you are in Judaism, you are cut off from God. You are under the authority of the devil. Okay? So we have to be careful. Like, the, you know, many Christians try and liken us to the people that are under the law. And it's, we're not. If you're under the law, you are cut off from God. Okay? And it says right here, the Jewish people and the Gentiles, anybody that's not a believer in Jesus is under the authority of the devil. And so what's the mechanism to get out? The mechanism to get out from under the authority of the devil is to receive forgiveness of sins. And so when Jesus washes away your sins, when you confess Jesus as Lord, your sins are washed away, you are forgiven, and the devil loses his authority over you. Okay, again, 1 John 5, 19, and there's a million other passages we could use, but this is three. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You know, so the devil, he is the God of this world. He is lording over all the people of the earth. He's ruling and reigning over everybody that is in his power, in his authority, in his kingdom, that is not a believer in Jesus. And if you are a believer in Jesus, then you're his number one enemy, and he wants to destroy you. Therefore, we need to pick up our toolkit of authority, the armor of God, so that we can defend ourselves against the devil and his kingdom. Okay? But, you know, these are just three passages that prove, you know, that the devil, he was in authority over the earth ever since Genesis chapter 3. So there was a transition of rulership over the earth. Okay, now let's, um, let's add in some more here. So there's, um, there's several passages that reveal that angels were actually ruling the earth okay and just so you know the devil is an angel all of his evil demons they're angels as well you know so they're they are angels and then as we look at these passages you'll see more and more confirmation that angels were actually ruling the, the world so acts 753 um, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it Okay, so this is talking about, you know, back in the Old Testament, the law was given by angels. Okay, and this is, I could have had a paragraph wrapped around it, and it would probably help to understand it, but the law was given by angels. Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter 2. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just reward. Okay, so what is this referring to? So there was a word back in the Old Testament that was spoken by angels, the law, and in the law, um, there you know it talks about uh, especially like in Leviticus, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, a blow for a blow, you know, like all this exchange of evil for evil, a repayment of evil for with evil, and so this is what this passage is talking about. Um, it's talking about there was a word spoken by angels, the eye for an eye, that that just repayment of evil with evil aspect of the law, that was spoken by angels. That is not, uh, Jesus rejected that. If you recall in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said to those of all. Um, and then it, was, then it was talking about this eye for an eye law, and Jesus rejected the eye for an eye law. He rejected that. And he said that we should not resist an evil person. He said that we should love our enemies. We should do good for them. We should bless them. We should pray for them. Okay, so that, that contradictory word in the law, which, which tells us to repay evil with evil, that was not from God. That was from angels. Okay, so that would have been a devilish angel, right? Uh, Hebrews 2.5 For he, God, has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels okay meaning 
the world to come will not be subjected to angels, but the world as it stands now is subjected to angels. And that subjection to angels happened in Genesis chapter 3, when the sin of mankind occurred, then we became slaves to obey the devil and his kingdom. The devil is an angel. The world is in subjection to angels. The world is being ruled by angels who gave a law. The world is being ruled by angels who put this eye for an eye, a repayment of evil with evil, a, a just reward for every transgression and disobedience, that, that repayment of evil for evil, they put that into place. That was all done by angels. You know, when Jesus refers to anything back in the law, he pulls out things related to love and mercy, right? He doesn't pull out eye for an eye. He rejects eye for an eye. But he, he draws upon the aspects that you can find in the law that relate to love and mercy. Okay? Then Galatians 3.19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. So again, this is another testament that the law came by way of angels. Okay? Now, let's look at um, some of the titles of the devil. He's called the ruler of this world. He's called the God of this world. Um, some people don't don't realize that. Um, and it'll help you understand some things. It'll help you get a better picture of who's actually in charge of things. So in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. John 14, 30, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. John 16, 11, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Okay, and then 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay, so all of these passages, so three times Jesus said that there's somebody else ruling the world. So here's, here's where we go wrong. Like people read the Old Testament and they think that Father God or Jesus um, was ruling and reigning. Some people say that Jesus was Yahweh, the Lord your God. And, and all those things are wrong. God was not ruling this world. Remember we said on this page that um, the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So God is ruling and reigning over the heavens, but the earth he gave it to men. And men, we gave it to the devil. And the devil is the ruler of this world. Three times Jesus said, the ruler of this world is being cast out. And then people get mad at me when I say, you know, all those evil deeds done in the Old Testament, that wasn't God ruling and reigning. That was, you know, the devil was ruling and reigning, committing all those atrocities. And, and they're like, no, God, God was ruling the earth. No, he wasn't. Jesus, the word of God said, God was not ruling this earth. The ruler of this world, I came... I came to this earth and for, for this purpose, I'm going to cast out the ruler of this world. So God was not ruling this earth. And in fact, in Matthew chapter 28, the last uh, couple of verses there, after it says that, you know, after Jesus ascended, all authority in heaven and on and earth has been given to him. Jesus didn't have a th authority over the earth until after he um, died and was resurrected and, and did all the things that he did. There was somebody else that had legal authority over all the earth. And it wasn't him. And so all the evil ruling and reigning in the Old Testament, it was the rulership, it was subjection of angels, it was under the power of darkness, the power of Satan, the authority of Satan. Um, it was not God ruling and reigning, doing all the evil things. And so when you really get this picture that Jesus came to cast out the ruler of this world, that he came to judge the ruler of this world, that there's a God of this world that was blinding the minds of people, then that gives you a much different framework with which to rightly divide the Old Testament. So when I read the Old Testament, my default perspective is that until I prove otherwise, I assume it's the ruler of this world and not God in a particular passage. If I can attribute good to it, then I'll say it's God. If I cannot attribute good to it, if it's evil or something like that, then it's clearly to me, it's the ruler of this world, right? Because Jesus did not have authority over the earth until after he was resurrected. He, uh, God was ruling the heavens. Man was ruling the earth. 
We submitted ourselves under the devil. And so that's caused all the problems for us. And thus someone else was ruling this world. And Jesus came to, to judge him, to, to cast him out and to free us from under his domain. Amen? Okay, now, importantly, you know, another proof point about the devil having lordship and rulership over all the earth is that, you know, he has the ability to give authority and to give glory as he wishes because he is, he became the legal, um, the legal authority over man and earth after Genesis chapter 3. And that means he can give it and take it as he wishes. And we see that in the temptation of Jesus. So again, Luke 4, verses 5 to 7. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Okay, so everything that the devil is tempting Jesus with are real temptations, things that man faces day in and day out. And one of the temptations of the devil, as, as ruler of this world, as God of this world, the devil liked to tempt people to give them authority, to give them rulership over over countries over nations over whatever you know give people authority give them glory like fame riches notoriety um because why because it has been delivered to him the sin of mankind submitted us under the devil's lordship we became slaves to obey the devil we were under the power and authority of the devil we were under the power of darkness the devil was above us and therefore, he could, as God of this world, he could give authority as he wished. He could take it away as he wished. He could give glory, fame, and riches as he wished. He could take it away as he wished. He was the legal ruler over this world. And what does he want? He wants to be worshipped. Amen? All of the evil ruling and reigning in the Old Testament was the devil. God is not half evil. All right, so we have one more page for today, and then we'll pick up in the next teaching. So, you know, thousands of years go by of man living under the devil's rule and reign. And so then Jesus came to this earth, and, and then man, you know, the, the disciples specifically started to have a taste of what it's like to have your authority, your dominion restored. Okay, so there was a period of time, you know, while Jesus was walking the earth, where he delegated authority before his work on the cross, he delegated authority to, you know, 12 disciples plus another 70, right? So Jesus, um, he came to this earth and he was commissioned to destroy the works of the devil. And there's a lot of passages we could use, but we'll just look at Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed okay so jesus came for many different purposes but all these things that are mentioned here they're all forms various forms of oppression of the devil you know so the devil was god of this world ruler of this world he rules with an iron fist he um you know, he's a tyrant he's a tyrannical ruler and so jesus came to undo all the things the devil was doing and so he came to preach the way out of the problem. Okay, so he preached the gospel. And you know, that is our ticket out from underneath the domain of the devil. Okay, Jesus came to heal broken hearts. You know, why are people broken hearted? Because the devil has caused, you know, hardship in their lives. Um, people are cut off from God and they're disconnected. So they're broken hearted. They're depressed. They're fearful. They're anxious. You know, the devil has stolen or killed and destroyed and they have heartache over the things that have been ruined or removed from their lives okay so when you're healing brokenhearted people that's you're setting people free from a form of oppression of the devil okay well jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives and you know that's a big subject and you know all the world was under captivity to the devil because of sin and so 
you know, at the broadest level, when we receive Jesus, then he has set us free. Um, he has set us free from bondage because it says here, we were slaves to obey the devil. When we still had our sins, we were slaves to obey the devil. And so that's bondage. And so we were in captivity. Um, we were in captivity to the devil. And so by, by confessing Jesus as Lord, obviously that we're set free from the devil's captivity. Okay, then you can also extend this to many other things like setting prisoners out and so many other things. But Jesus also came to bring physical healing, you know, recovery of sight to the blind as an example. So anytime somebody has sickness or injury or ailment of any kind in their body or in their soul, you know, that is a form of oppression of the devil. You know, you can look at Acts 10 38, where it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You know, so Jesus was, um, whenever you're healing somebody, whether you're healing their body or healing their soul, you're setting them free from oppression of the devil. So he's the cause of that. And then um, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So there's so many kinds of oppression. Um, it could be poverty. It could be sickness. It could be hardship. You know, there's all kinds of uh, forms of oppression. And so this is just an example of Jesus's commission in coming to the earth was to destroy these works of the devil and, and even other works. Okay. So, you know, Jesus can't do all that work by himself. And so he delegated authority to um, his disciples before the cross. Um, Luke chapter nine, verse one to two. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Okay, so here he took his 12 and he gave them power and authority. So this is, um, you know, this is legal authority. It's, you know, he shared his authority so that the disciples were able to heal the sick and cast out demons. Luke uh, chapter 10. Then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Okay, so you can see that he extended this delegation of authority. You know, so he started with the 12, then he extended it to the 70. And you know, there they had dominion over the demons by way of this delegated temporary authority. And so they were able to cast them out. And then Jesus um, elaborates and says, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. And that's just you know, any form of evil, whether it's a demon, whether it's some work of the devil like sickness or disease uh, and over all the power of the enemy. Okay, so Jesus gave his disciples delegated authority before the cross. And then that allowed the disciples to destroy the works of the devil. Okay. And then Matthew chapter 10. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. And that word's exousia, which means authority. He gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So again, when we receive the authority of Jesus Christ, then that gives us supreme authority over every um, evil spirit, okay? And every work of the devil. In particular, the devil's favorite way to oppress man is with sickness and disease. Okay, then Mark chapter three. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Okay, so you can see that, you know, for the first time, man was having a taste of what it's like to operate in the authority of Christ. And with the authority of Christ, you're healing bodies, you're healing souls, you're even raising the dead. You know, you're, you're stopping you know, storms, you're saving, you're helping. And, and all of that comes by having the authority of Christ in your life. And all of that was the intention of God from the very beginning, fill the earth and subdue it. And so on day one of, of man's existence, we had the ability to subdue evil and not be subjected to it. But unfortunately, because of the sin, we, we submitted ourselves underneath all that tyranny of the devil. Okay, so, so now Jesus, he's coming to destroy that tyranny of the devil. 
and this delegation of authority allowed people to work with him to destroy the works of the devil. Okay, so how did they operate in authority? And so this is this is where we want to get to. So, you know, in the upcoming teachings, we're going to talk about, you know, when you're born again, then you naturally receive the authority of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be delegated authority like these disciples. This is like um, 82 people out of all the earth had, um, had the authority of Christ. Whereas, you know, when we become believers, we naturally receive the authority of Christ. So we don't have to receive a delegated authority that's temporary, but for believers, it's a permanent condition. And so what we need to learn is how do we operate in authority? And we'll elaborate this in a future teaching, but it's clearly exemplified you know, through these passages. So Matthew chapter eight. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Okay, so this centurion, you know, Jesus said that he had great faith. There's only two people in the Gospels that Jesus said had great faith. It was this person, and it was also a woman who, the, who was insistent and persistent that her daughter be healed. So that we see the two qualities of great faith from Jesus's perspective are number one, uh, learning how to operate in authority. And then number two, being persistent and insistent so that we never back down, but that we always press forward and push in to receive the things of God. Okay, and so it's real simple. You know, he, he's saying the way that authority works is I speak a word and my servant, um, well, sorry, wrong passage. I, I say to this one, go and he goes. Come and he comes. Do this and he does it. Okay, so he's illustrating his understanding of authority because he is above the people that are under his command. And all he has to do is speak a word. He just has to give a command. And because he's in authority, then that command must be obeyed, right? And so in the same way, when Jesus gives us authority, you just speak a command and you have to know that you have authority. You have to know that you're in charge. And when you know that you're in charge and you speak a command, it must be obeyed. The devil must obey your command. Amen? And so it's a simple concept, right? So, so when we lay hold of it, then we can simply do as he said, only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Amen? So no matter what the work of the devil is, we command the devil to go. And we command the solution to come. It's all about commanding. And two examples of that. So in Mark chapter 9, 25 to 26, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead so that many said he is dead. Okay, so Jesus, you know, he rebuked. A rebuke is a sharp, authoritative reprimand. You know, a rebuke is not gently and mildly saying, you know, devil come out, but it's, it's sharp, it's bold, it's authoritative, right? And so I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. So there is some uh, intensity in the way Jesus was commanding the spirit. Like there's some fervency attached to it. It's not meek and mild, but it's fervent. It is a rebuke. Amen. And then, of course, the spirit had to obey and it came out. And then in Mark chapter four, then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. OK, so um, all of this is telling us that the way authority works is by commanding. And so this is what this is what believers are restored to. We are restored to dominion above the devil, to where he is beneath us, to where we command him. Him and his work shall obey our commands. These disciples had a taste of it. You know, so 82 people had a taste of it. Um, but all believers after the cross, um, we have received that authority of Christ. 
Okay, so what we'll talk about next time, we'll talk about um, believer's authority after the cross. Then we'll talk about unborn again man still lies under the devil's authority. And then ultimately all things will submit to God so things will be corrected in due time. But I think the key thing here is this page right here. If people will understand that God was not ruling and reigning in the Old Testament, the devil was. When you understand that the devil was ruling and reigning, then you'll have a much easier time understanding what's going on in the Old Testament when all the evil deeds are happening. I mean, this is like life changing right here. The devil is, was the God of this world. The devil was the ruler of this world. At the, at the time that Jesus came and all the time before, the devil was the legal ruler of this world, the legal God of this world. That will entirely change your perspective about what's happening in the Old Testament.